Well, thanks, Gareth. Um, so, for those of you that don't know, um, Gareth is a serverless. Um, he, he is a serverless architect at Serverless Inc. Um, the famous framework, the one that started it all. So he's going to tell us a bit more about real stories from the trenches. From the trenches. So I'm quite excited to hear what he has in store for us. Thanks, Gareth. Hello, everybody. Um, so thanks for. Oh, yeah. Uh, would you mind muting? Sorry, dude. Oh, Chuck's, yes. Okay, cool. Sorry, it was just massive echo. Anyway, um, so thanks, uh, Ryan, and everybody involved in the meetup for allowing me to have a chat with everybody today about serverless application development. Uh, Ryan was telling me that folks here may have some uh, understanding of what this stuff is and the AWS stuff behind the scenes. So thankfully, this doesn't go into like too much started detail about what AWS is and all the cloud stuff related to serverless. Um, but yeah, um, this is uh, another another quarantine video. You can see Ray and I have some really great uh, quarantine hair going. Uh, so, <laughs> so pretty fun times. Uh, but I'm not the president. I'm not here to update you on the COVID situation. Uh, we're going to chat about serverless application development. And um, this is, oh, if I find, there we go. This is me. Um, my name is Gareth Lukomsky. Um, hi. I am a solutions architect at Serverless Inc., the creators and maintainers of the open source uh, serverless framework, uh, probably the most popular uh, framework for serverless application development at the moment. Um, I started my serverless sort of career in 2016, uh, starting to build serverless applications and solutions, kind of near, near the beginning of things. And if anybody does want to uh, converse with me and add me and so on, you can find me at Gareth MCC on Twitter. Um, I'm open to discussions there and love talking about this stuff. So feel free to harass me about serverless as much as you like. And just to get us started, kind of what's the point? Besides a pretty nice picture from the beach down the road here in Cape Town, uh, what is the entire point of the discussion tonight? And serverless development is one of those sort of brand new uh, architectures and and, and uh, development environments we find ourselves in these days. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff still being discovered and figured out when it comes to uh, serverless application development. What are the best practices and what are other people doing? And I, sometimes I feel there isn't enough knowledge here about uh, what what other people have experienced and what maybe I as a, as, as a developer should be aware of getting into uh, serverless. And that's really what this uh, talk is about. This is to me sort of the highlights of my time building serverless applications, kind of the stumbling blocks I ran into and some of the great things as well that I've discovered along the way that just kind of blows my mind. So to get us straight into this, let's start right at the beginning. If you're getting into serverless development for the first time, you need to know how to get started. And the idea here is that you've got this new shiny toy, uh, and, uh, you know, you're looking at serverless development, you've tried out the serverless framework or another framework that you may, may like the look of, and this is all very exciting and new. And the idea is, to get started with anything, and this, is, this applies not just to serverless, but to any technology, in my opinion, is aim small and miss small. Pick something that isn't monstrously huge, and uh, if you end up destroying something in your production application, it's not the end of the world, but it's still meaningful in some way that you can actually gauge any benefit you may have gotten from it. And I'm gonna go through an example of what, 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 I, what me and my team uh, ended up doing at the time. And just to set the scene a little bit, uh, this is a small team of developers. Back in 2016, I find myself as the lead of a, of a small team of us, two of us developers. We grew a little bit over time, but in the start, it was just the two of us. And there was the we were we were responsible for maintaining an online uh, platform built on WordPress uh, that was serving the needs for a multi-million-dollar uh, travel company. Um, and obviously, this you know they, they, they had over time. that has been 10 years uh, building on top of this uh, a WordPress platform. And it needed some organization. There were some issues happening. There were some real problems. It was showing its age. And it was time to, just, to, to, to decide how to re-architect things, how to improve things and make it better. So uh, the other side of this was the, that the, we didn't have any in-house DevOps in the, in the company. There was just the two of us. And while I feel like I can spin up an EC2 instance, throw Ubuntu on it, and get some stuff up and running, I don't feel like I'm particularly you know, the best to do a production-ready uh, installation on virtual machines. I could probably get away with it, uh, but I prefer to have somebody in the know who knows what they're doing, building this, these things out and managing them correctly. When I got there, the company had just gotten a consultancy to set everything up, that sort of typical three, uh, 
three uh, instances spread across availability zones with a load balancer and so on and so on. That's a usual architecture that you see with a lot of modern applications built on EC2. But we needed to modernize. We needed to find a way to uh, improve the existing system, but with lack of DevOps capabilities. And you can see where I'm going with this because serverless sounded absolutely great for this. When I started just messing around and doing my little hello world applications and getting an API gateway, talking to a Lambda function, writing into an R a relational database at the time, more about that later. Uh, serverless sounded like a fantastic way to solve our problems. It removed a lot of the infrastructure load from us as a team. And I mean, that meant we could just focus on developing our application, which sounded like a, a panacea for us. So we needed to pick something to essentially prove a concept. You can't take this brand new tool with such a new way of doing things and just uh, start rewriting everything from scratch. We needed to pick something that we could proof it on, show to the, to the organization that this was the way we wanted to go and why. And we ended up choosing a feature of the, of the, uh, of the platform that was related to reviews. So this little widget on a homepage uh, was part of the review system that was available on the, that, that is available on the site. And we chose this as our target. And it's not just this, I'm gonna go into a bit more detail, but for a poor company or a travel company that is trying to convince somebody to spend a fairly large amount of money on a product, they need the person needs to be sure that this is an up and up company, that you're gonna get the product you pay for, and that it's worth the money to spend. So reviews are very important. If reviews go down, you're not going to block people's ability to buy, but it's still a fairly important thing. You don't, you want to avoid having go down if you can. So this is on the homepage. You can see here, this is to give somebody new to the, the company. This is a review of us. We have 5, 000, over 5,000 reviews, really good reviews. We know what we're talking about. You go to a specific product page, you get a summary of reviews on that product page. You can see oh, 51 other people reviewed this, this specific tour as a really good one. And then further down the product page, you can, go, you can go read the actual reviews as you continue. So pretty important, but again, not critical. If this goes down, people can still go through the checkout process, and it's a great way to test this. And ultimately, what this meant was that we ended up re-architecting the front end of the uh, WordPress application to um, create API calls into a serverless uh, API backend that was pulling these, these, this information out of a database. And this worked incredibly well for us. This completely uh, blew everybody away that was involved, including us as a, as a developer team. And it worked so well that we could actually, in New Relic, which we were using at the time to help monitor things, we could actually, in New Relic, see the dip in uh, CPU cycles or, or, or capacity that was being used on the EC2 instances just by having these items moved away from the EC2 infrastructure that was being run at the time for the entire application. So again, it's, it's, it aims relatively small, and if we had messed it up, reviews go away. If we hadn't, reviews stay up and nobody's the wiser. But it proved to us that this serverless thing was what we could do, and that's what you should be looking at. There are alternatives as well. It doesn't have to be a specific uh, feature set in your existing application that you strangle out, uh, as the pattern is known. You could do something like take the cron jobs that you normally spin up that little EC2 micro instance uh, to run all your cron jobs. You could turn all of those into uh, serverless applications. There are many, many ways to try and get some value out of serverless without completely rewriting everything from scratch before you realize whether this is what you want or not. So start small, go small, and, and, and ascertain some value. Moving on though, uh, shortly after we started building these things and then getting really, uh, uh, coming up to a very important sale time for the company as a whole, sort of coming to the near, near the end of the year, company wants to put out a sale to try and, and, and sell more seats in, on the tours, we needed, we were re-architecting uh, large portions of the site. And the, the site as a whole ran on relational databases, as most applications do, especially back in 2016. And our serverless architecture followed suit. Unfortunately, this uh, caused us a few problems. Um, the reality with serverless is that even to this day, even with a lot of changes that have been made with AWS, some really fantastic changes, by the way, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, VPC and RDA still is a bit of a, a bit of an issue to try and use really well with uh, serverless application development. So what do I mean by that? Well, what really what really happens is that with relational databases, relational databases depend on a connection pool, and the problem with that is that if you if you have lambda functions running in parallel, each of those lambda functions is consuming an individual connection to your relational database. And for example, we were, we were trying to follow the microservices approach of a single database for a single service. 
So we had a service that was running a, t a, a micro instance a relational database, which has about 60 connections. And very, very quickly, you have a, a set of a, a bunch of traffic is pushed at the uh, Lambda functions, and those connections are used up pretty quickly. And this resulted in us having issues where looking like the database was down. A restart in the database fixes the issue temporarily because suddenly people can come back on and it falls over again when I mean, all the connections are used up again. Um, we solved the problem temporarily just by, by uh, in uh, upgrading the size of the instance to manage that. But ultimately, we had to rethink how you were doing that because we couldn't just uh, manage the connection issue here. The other side, unfortunately, is that VPC, especially back in 2016, was, uh, was causing us some pain. And this was something that was a little bit hidden to us at the time because uh, VPC, adding, uh, to be able to talk to a relational database through something like Lambda requires that you, you connect via a VPC. And VPC had, not anymore, which I'm going to get to, VPC had a, a, a bad characteristic of taking up to about 10 seconds sometimes uh, in cold start latencies. Not exactly the greatest when you have an API backend that's trying to be as low latency as possible. Uh, so this was causing us uh, some issues as well. These days, the pictures are, pictures are a little bit different. So I can't say that uh, relational databases and VPCs are totally useless for serverless. They were, they were close to that in the past, unless you had some very specific workloads that didn't really care about that latency and connection issue. Uh, but these days, there are tools like RDS Proxy, for example, that manages the connection pooling issue, that, so you won't necessarily have that problem anymore. Uh, and VPC has been improved amazingly well. It still does add some latency to the, the cold starts of Lambda functions, but it's no longer that sort of up to 10 seconds massive amount of latency that we would have seen uh, last year, for example. So one word of caution, if you are looking to build a serverless application and you want to use a relational database, look at using RDS proxy and even the new data API, which I've got listed, listed here. But AWS has a data API, which also has its own sort of performance quirks but that may be good enough for your use case and can bypass VPC and RDS proxy anyway. So there's some alternatives for you there. Alrighty, so one of the contentious topics that I see talked about all the time ad nauseum about serverless application development is the cost associated with serverless. And people will just take a look and take someone's word for the fact that serverless is expensive. Somebody spun up a, 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 some uh, uh, API gateway endpoints in an S3 bucket with the Lambda, and the Lambda and the Lambda got spammed by S3 requests, and suddenly the bill got blown out. And now serverless is expensive. Let's not use it. Um, the, the the truth of the matter is that when you take into consideration something like total cost of ownership, serverless starts not looking as expensive anymore. So what I mean by that? Well, first of all, it's not necessarily more expensive than what you normally used to building, and there's a lot of reasons why. The first one is that. As opposed to infrastructure like EC2 and RDS, there is a permanent free tier on a lot of these sort of serverless AWS services, the likes of Lambda, API Gateway, DynamoDB, and so on. And when you, normally when you're talking about a free tier, folks seem to think, oh, well, that's nothing. That's like just enough for a developer to get going. The reality is that the free tier for these services is actually pretty generous. And I've actually worked for organizations where the free tier has encompassed their entire bill. This is an actual bill from a client of mine that has a serverless service running that serves a few thousand requests a day, and their bill was 58 US cents at the end of the month. And this is not uh, when we first launched. This was two months ago after this service, the, this um, solution has been running for about a year. And that 58 cents would have been zero if it wasn't for Route 53 DNS queries actually hiking the bill up to 58 cents. So right away, you have a free tier that could potentially encompass your entire bill. But if your usage is so low that you're within the free tier, your bill wouldn't have been that huge to begin with. What the free tier is great for is if you're learning serverless and getting into this in the first place, your bill will be probably lower than that 58 cents because you'll be encompassed completely within the free tier, which is pretty awesome. The next thing, though, to consider is, and a lot of folks don't seem to uh, uh, take this into consideration, is that unlike uh, a set of infrastructure running on EC2 and containers and Kubernetes and, and RDS and all of the others, is that all of that infrastructure is permanently running. There's always something that's going to be up uh, charging you by the minute for a uh, time that you're not actually using it for. When you're running EC2 instance at two in the morning, there's nobody you know, driving traffic through there, but that EC2 instance is still costing you money. If you have an API gateway endpoint uh, provisioned, nobody is making queries at 2 a.m., so you're not actually paying any bill. Uh, your scale goes to zero, and, you, and there's no cost to you when there's no traffic. And not only that, 
when you uh, with with services like API Gateway, uh, Lambda, and so on, there's nothing for you to manage. There's no operating system that you need to maintain. There's no application software. Uh, there's there's none of that infrastructure that needs to be managed and maintained over time and potentially scaled as your uh, needs grow. So you don't need somebody on staff that understands all of this technology to build that out for you. And while bigger organizations will already have staff like this on hand, those poor folks are normally work to the bone anyway, trying to provide all the services that they can to the organization they're with because there just aren't that many folks out there with these skills. Having, having really good DevOps professionals out there that know what they're doing are in short supply and can get very expensive. People cost money. You need... You, if you are hiring people to manage your infrastructure, you could be spending that money on on, on growing your product instead. So it's giving it, it's costing you not just in the actual cost of paying the salaries, but in the ability for you to be agile and grow your company. So EC2 will always be cheaper than uh, other infrastructure potentially because with reserved instances and spot instances, you can find workarounds to get that up and running. But again, you need somebody knowledgeable enough to know how to set all of that up and manage it for you. Your agility then becomes sacrificed because if you're in this more uh, static infrastructure, you need somebody who can take the time on request to go ahead and start scaling things up, increase the size of that RDS database, allow a larger pool of uh, a web servers, uh, set up the uh, the caching layers that you need, and, and all this infrastructure uh, that the developers now have to sit around and wait for somebody with the right skills to set up. Whereas with serverless, you have services available, you can include them in your configuration and deploy them immediately into the cloud within minutes. Not to mention, like I said, there's that shortage of skills to worry about. And to put this into perspective, this is I pulled up, I think, about two weeks ago, and this is the average uh, DevOps engineer salary in the US. I know we're in South Africa, but you know they didn't have these kind of stats, at least that I could find for South Africa. It doesn't matter. This paints the picture anyway. $135,000 a year for a, an average DevOps engineer salary is pretty high anyway. Uh, and that is a cost that you, you could be incurring in your organization. Imagine what you could be doing with that if you didn't have to pay for that salary and you could get all that infrastructure out. You can lessen the load on the existing DevOps mem uh, guys in your team and you can get the developers building out a uh, product even at a faster scale. So to move away from the cost issue, the other very contentious issue that I often uh, see, and I was just having a discussion now on, on Slack with some folks about cold starts. And this is another one of those things where somebody hears about this cold start issue, they hear about how long it might take for a, uh, a, server, a Lambda function to be warmed and available and start executing, and they think that completely breaks everything and you cannot use serverless at all. Well, the reality is that uh, cold starts are not, as content, as, are not as impactful as they might seem, They're not as negatively impactful as they might seem. The reason I could say this is that just over time, I've experienced what cold starts have done to applications that I've been involved with and helped build. And this is one example. I was working with an e-commerce organization. We were busy building a bunch of serverless stuff, but one of the first things we put out was a, essentially a API gateway request that made, made a call to a Lambda function on every single page load of the, of the, of the e-commerce platform. So every morning at about 8 a.m., the company would send out a, a newsletter to the, the customers who signed up for it. Uh, these people would then click on a link because this was the, you know, the, the list of the latest daily specials. Uh, so people would click through to the link, and every morning, like Clockwork, we'd have 10, uh, eight to 10,000 simultaneous users on the site within seconds. People would just be eagerly waiting at 8 a.m. for that email, click the link, and be bang, be on the site, 10,000 people instantly. And I wanted to see, I was very curious to find out what that looked like uh, it, in CloudWatch, inside AWS, what this looked like on our concurrency uh, limit. I knew we had a 3,000 concurrency limit because our infrastructure was hosted in Ireland, which has a default Lambda concurrency of 3,000. And I wanted to see if we got anywhere near that. <clears throat> and to my surprise, the highest number I saw through, uh, through about the two weeks that I spent watching this every morning was when we had about 10,000 10, simultaneous users on the site. There was only seven cold starts. And I was wondering to myself why this happened. And the simple reason is that if you think about how Lambda, Lambda functions execute and the behavior of users, most users coming to the site do not arrive at instantaneously the exact same millisecond. And because I have Lambda functions spinning up in parallel, as soon as one has spun up, has executed, and has finished executing a request that has come in, it is now warmed and ready to receive the next request that's coming in. So that means that when that first Lambda function that cold started, a second one might have a third, a fourth, a fifth, sixth, or seventh, according to these numbers. By the time the seventh one had cold started, the first one had finished execution, and the eighth request that came in was hitting a warm Lambda function, which was faster. 
by the time that the uh, ninth land request had come in, the second one had finished execution, so now that one was warm, and so on and so on. So now we have two warm Lambda functions receiving requests coming in, and straight away we no longer have uh, any more call starts happening which is a fantastic situation to be in. These Lambda functions are executing so quickly that they can finish execution and be ready to receive the next before the traffic really piles up on the back end, causing us any issues. And you may be saying, well, oh, that's great, Gareth. That's a great one uh, data sample. Um, yeah, I'm sure that there are other examples out there that, that don't see that kind of behavior. So I took a look around. And at, uh, at Serverless, we have a platform that we provide as a part of the Serverless framework where you can attach a whole bunch of features, including monitoring of your serverless services when you deploy them. And we use our monitoring platform to monitor our monitoring platform. It's a nice bit of inception there. And this is a period that I took over 24 hours, just looking at the amount of Lambda functions that are invoked on our platform. And we had about three and a half million Lambda functions for this specific Lambda function I'm looking at now. Three and a half million requests coming for this one Lambda function over a 24 hour period. That's a fair amount of traffic. I then took this and in the platform, I filtered this by cold start so I could see how many of these invocations were cold starts. And that ended up being about 944. So to put that in perspective, three and a half million uh, Lambda functions were invoked and only 944 of them were maybe delayed by maybe about a second, if, if, if not less. That ended up being about 0 0.1, let's make it 0 point, uh, 0 0.03 uh, Lambda functions. Uh, that may have been delayed maybe by about one second. So really, in the grand scheme of things, that is nothing. The, 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 the effect of cold starts on this kind of traffic is absolutely negligible. There is really nothing to worry about here. And, and, and really, if you have 0 0.03 of your traffic maybe experiencing a little bit of a slowdown, imagine on EC2 infrastructure, infrastructure we have multiple threads on a single machine with a, one, with a single CPU and a set amount of memory, the noisy neighbor situation that you can get in from one badly coded script that is slowing down a whole bunch of other people on the same machine, you, you'd, you'd expect a, a much bigger effect there. This is absolutely nothing. But of course, this is a volume. So maybe you are in a situation where you do want to reduce this. You want to find ways to make this cold start as negligible as possible. So how do we do that? Well, uh, the funny thing is at lower traffic volumes, cold start latencies become a lot more obvious. And I'm going to say right up front here, if you're developing your own serverless service and you expect to have traffic, don't take your, your experience as a developer testing things in the cloud as to what your users are going to experience. When you're developing a serverless application, you're calling maybe once every hour, two hours, but while you're busy testing things. That's going to be a cold start every single time. When you redeploy your, uh, your function into AWS, you're resetting the, sort of the, the, the cold start clock on that Lambda function every time you deploy it. So your experience as a developer in the cloud is going to be way worse than what your users are going to experience. So just bear that in mind. But you may be in a, in a really sensitive, really, even if 0 0.03 is, uh, is too much for you, there are ways that you can consider to reduce that. So let's take a look. In, and this is increasing order of effect, uh, basically. So one thing that a lot of folks will talk about is finding ways to decrease the, 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 the size of the uh, environment that, the, that has to be pulled in into a Lambda function. And when you're deploying with something like the serverless framework, you can often see the size of the Lambda function packages that get pushed into the cloud. Um, and there are ways to reduce this package size. And personally, I've never really seen this have a major effect. Uh, you may get a couple of milliseconds here or there. Uh, I just haven't seen this, but you know, if you want to go ahead and find ways to reduce the package size, there are, for the serverless framework, for example, there are bundlers you can use, uh, plugins that will run a webpack on top of your code, do some nice tree shaking to eliminate uh, stuff that you don't need, uh, package that up and then push that into the cloud at a much smaller size, and maybe you see an effect here. Something worth trying. The next level up from that, though, that I found really incredibly useful is consider increasing the memory size allocated to your Lambda function. And for anyone who doesn't realize this, increasing memory size for Lambda isn't just a memory increase. It also linearly scales up CPU allocation. So if you double the memory allocation for your Lambda function, you, you essentially double the CPU capacity. That's different when you get up to the sort of max memory capacities. There's all sorts of other CPU things that AWS does there that, that you know, adds extra cores and stuff like that. But if you're anywhere between sort of the 128 at the minimum up to the 1024, which is getting close to the maximum, you're basically doubling CPU if you double memory. 
And network is affected in a similar way. It's not exactly linearly, but you do increase your network allocation too. So this is this is where a massive increase in uh, lambda cold start times can be uh, can be fixed. You essentially increase that memory size. You're going to pay a bit more for your every, every hundred milliseconds of execution time. That's that's just part of it. But your cold starts are going to dramatically drop, and as a bonus, your lambda functions are start, going, to, going to start executing a lot faster. So hey, you're not only in decreasing your cold start uh, times, you're also decreasing the execution times of your lambda functions. Bonus, you're getting faster lambdas. Of course, there is a final method that guarantees zero cold start times. It just means you have to pay for it. And this is a new feature that came out with AWS uh, November last year at reInvent called provision concurrency. You can essentially just say, I don't want cold starts, here's my wallet. And you pay for uh, provision concurrency. It makes sure that you always have a warm Lambda function, but now you're starting to slide back into sort of EC2 realm where you always have something that's billing you by the minute because you have this warm Lambda function that is always sitting there waiting for traffic just in case it comes. So it really ends up being a decision your way. How important is it to remove cold starts versus how much are you willing to spend on uh, removing these cold starts? Um, so there, there is a way for you to find to reduce that. All right, so moving on a bit from uh, the cold start things. This is uh, when I was a, working at uh, an e-commerce retailer, uh, we were in an in a interesting situation where we wanted to find a way to load balance an application. And this was because every Black Friday, things just fell over. Um, well, to be fair, things didn't just fall over. There were struggles, there were problems. We wanted to make sure that this wasn't gonna happen uh, with the Black Friday coming. We wanted to find some way to create a load balanced application, uh, you know, test out, you know, sort of simultaneous users being pushed at the application on the sort of staging environment with a replica of the existing infrastructure to make sure that it would be able to handle the load. And um, sorry, this is this is where we were in a situation where we needed to find a way to run binaries that weren't included in Lambda. One of the downsides of Lambda is that it has the capability of uh, you're you're able to import other binaries into the into Lambda itself, but Executing them, you might have some problems. So um, I showed the example here of Bcrypt. Uh, Node has a essentially an application that is uh, compiled in C called Bcrypt that uh, lets you do encryption uh, algorithms on top of, of, of whatever code you've got. Um, the upside of using the C-based library is that it's incredibly fast, uh, but AWS doesn't quite support this. Uh, running that C library, the, 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 the required libraries in the VM just don't exist, and you're gonna see errors when you execute this code. Um, so instead of running this, there is an alternative. There is a module called bcrypt.js, which I've used extensively with great success. It is a bit slower. Well, it can be quite slow compared to the, the native bcrypt. But fortunately, Lambda gives you that lovely uh, uh, knob you can uh, dial, you can turn, uh, set up the memory size a bit higher so that your, your bcrypt.js uh, execution happens a lot faster because now you've got much more CPU allocation. And you can tweak some bcrypt settings so you don't quite blow the settings out of the water. And you can end up with some really decent performance on bcrypt.js and still have the full bcrypt functionality available to you. So there's alternatives to that. You'll also find when you a lot of folks uh, see some value in Lambda, and this is where the load balancer example comes in, uh, when you want to run something like the headless Chrome inside a Lambda function. It's a really interesting use case, but the Chrome binary has some really funny issues because at one point, we were experimenting with running Chrome headless inside Lambda, and it was running, it was actually executing. We were having some great success. Um, the downside is that uh, at some point, Lambda updated itself, or sorry, Chrome updated itself. Uh, we were running a newer version of Chrome, and now it required certain libraries that are normally available on a Linux machine. By default, you know, you don't normally worry about it. It's just, it's usually there. But because of the optimized nature of Lambda, those libraries just were not available for this new version of Lambda. So the only way we found to resolve this problem was to force the package we were using to keep to a very old version of Chrome, which means we still had Chrome running, but it was a really old version of Chrome. So, you know, does it doesn't do the job. It did for us, um, but your mileage may vary. However, this, the, this problem was kind of solved to a large degree, especially when you want to do uh, uh, custom run times, because one of the other situations we found ourselves in is that we needed a PHP binary to execute some PHP on a Lambda function. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll get to that in a second. But the problem with, with PHP is, again, it assumes certain libraries are available on the host OS. 
Uh, what we ended up having to do was compile PHP specifically for Lambda to include all the features and, and so on that we needed it. But uh, you can now use something like uh, Lambda layers to incorporate uh, a runtime. Uh, you can basically bring your own runtime to Lambda these days. So this is a really great way to, and this is kind of like the only use case that I really think Lambda the layers shines in. Lambda layers is absolutely awesome at including your own runtime. And this is just an example of existing layers that you can include in your Lambda function and, and write scripts for as if it was a native runtime. It's a pretty cool feature. Uh, you can see PHP at the bottom there is included as well. And there's tons of these available. You can, you can probably find everybody has their own uh, layer with a runtime. And really great feature to get that runtime binary in without necessarily worrying about all the uh, missing features and so on that you might need. So to get to the next part of this, I'm going to talk about a something that folks may already be familiar with. If you're new to serverless, though, this is some this is a an issue that I need to uh, bring up. Something for you to watch out for as you build your serverless application, because uh, unfortunately we do see this use case quite a lot. Uh, working at serverless, I work with a lot of customers a lot of the time, and we often get this request from users asking us, how do we get around? the CloudFormation, uh, the 200 resource CloudFormation limit that exists in AWS. Um, and the thing to bear in mind is CloudFormation is a service provided by AWS as a, as a tool for uh, DevOps professionals looking to deploy, co deploy infrastructure into their AWS accounts. And then along comes folks like uh, Serverless uh, and others who see CloudFormation as a really great tool to build serverless applications on top of except CloudFormation wasn't really built for that uh, from the get-go. So it's not optimized to be used as a platform for application development necessarily. It's meant for you to have a place to uh, configure out, out your, uh, your infrastructure. And a, re a resource limit of 200 sounds like a really high number when you look at it from a sort of a DevOps point of view. Uh, but when you're doing application development and you have lots of, lots of small amounts of resources all over the place, it starts becoming, uh, it can become an issue to deal with. So yeah, it is a CloudFormation limit, 200 resources max per stack, so if you're not aware of that, you can fit at most 200 resources expressed within a CloudFormation stack. Um, and that equates to you know, one Lambda function and one API gateway endpoint inside the serverless framework equates to about seven resources used up just on that alone. But there are ways around this. So there are ways to mitigate this. And I'm going to go through a couple of these in sort of incre increasing order of uh, preference, I guess you could say. So the first one, that if somebody came to me tomorrow and said, Gareth, I've been building this service for a really long time. I have about 20 Lambda functions, each with their own API gateway endpoint, and I'll keep getting this error about 200 resource limit from CloudFormation. What do I do now? My answer to them will be, you need to get your, your service deployed right now. Go take a look at the existing plugins inside the service framework that can help you with nested stacks. And really what this is, is CloudFormation has the ability for you to create one CloudFormation stack within the other. So instead of de deploying all the resources for your service within one CloudFormation stack, you now create one which contains only a small portion of the resources you need, and it uses up a resource allocation in its sort of parent CloudFormation stack, and so on and so on up the stack. CloudFormation stacks all the way down. This is a great stopgap, in my opinion. This is a great way to sort of keep the ball rolling so that you can get what you need to do done. But all it is, in my opinion, really great for is to buy you the time you need to then move on to something else that can help you solve the problem. And one of the other steps that we, some, we, can, we some of the advice folks who have the opportunity to, to look at doing is, is, is building something called a mono lambda. And this, the idea of this is that instead of multiple uh, lambda functions, each with their own API gateway endpoint, which is the ideal, to be perfectly honest, you could uh, temporarily solve the problem again by having only a single API gateway endpoint uh, that, that proxies all requests, so it receives all requests to uh, that specific uh, URL uh, allocated by API Gateway. And it points to a single Lambda function, and you have a Lambda function that will then uh, do the do the actual uh, routing for you uh, at that point to the, to, to the correct uh, destination of code or whatever you want to run. And you see this often with, uh, with uh, um, frameworks like Express and Flask. This is a pattern often used by folks who are bringing an Express or a Flask application into serverless. They want to lift and shift that in. So this is a great technique for those folks who just want to get some of the benefits of building a serverless application using Express and Flask. And I see Wayne Gibson men mentioning Lambda Lift. Yep, that's, that's kind of the other name for it. Um, so the idea here is that you limit the number of API gateway endpoints and the number of Lambda functions so that you reduce that uh, resource count. 
really the, the most ideal situation that I think you can find yourself in doing this is, and this is why you'll see a lot of talk uh, in serverless about microservices uh, or, or building your serverless application as a collection of microservices is partly because of this 200 resource limit. And it solves this problem by, by building your application as a collection of, of micro and macro services, you are solving the problem of the 200 resource limit. But the micro and macro services, and I call it macro services as well because the, the, the sort of terminology is, is shifting a bit as to what is micro, what is macro. So it's somewhere in between there. Uh, but the idea is that you can build these smaller uh, uh, chunks of, of, of features that together make up the whole of your application. And this gives you some incredible advantages. Microservices as a concept is a really great idea in structuring an application, but it has serious problems when it comes to the infrastructure burden it adds onto teams, which is why teams like Uber really excel at this because they have a, a, an enormous uh, amount of talent in the organization to manage the infrastructure burden that microservices adds. However, you and me and most developers don't really have the ability to manage that really complex set of infrastructure that traditional microservices gives you in Kubernetes and all the rest. But serverless helps solve that problem uh, enormously well. It removes a lot of that infrastructure burden away from you. You're gonna be reusing the same services that you've used for every other, every other serverless uh, service you're building. You're deploying using API Gateway, Lambda, DynamoDB, S3, and so on repeatedly, so you're familiar with these services. And listen, there's nothing to manage, there's nothing to worry about. You, know, you don't need to maintain this, you deploy it, you update it, and that's the, the only management portion involved in that is how do you deploy this into the cloud. So ultimately, you want to get to a micro sort of, sort of micro macro services uh, setup because that completely avoids the, the, this 200 limit. But if you find yourself stuck with that, nested stacks and a mono lambda or lambda lith approach is a great stopgap to get you to the point where you can now sit down and start uh, strangling out some stuff from your lambda lith, as it were. Alrighty, so the, 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 the Lambda supercomputer, and this is one of the really exciting parts, and I've mentioned the idea of a uh, load balancer, and this is where we really get, get into the meat of this, because not a load balancer, a load testing. And Lambda is a monster. It is a beast at compute. If you want to compute large amounts of stuff, Lambda is where it's at, and I'm, and I'm not kidding. Um, the, if you, the Lambda supercomputer is kind of a joke, uh, you know, but it, if you think about, uh, you can have in, in, in regions like Ireland, you can have 3,000 Lambda functions running concurrently in parallel. 3,000 threads in parallel, well, not, you're not even threads, VMs running in parallel, executing the same function. You could potentially run multiple uh, workloads in each of those, which is exactly what we did. Uh, when we built uh, a load testing application uh, as part of, in, in the e-commerce uh, organization that, that I was with a couple of years ago. And what this means is that we were trying to find a way to test the infrastructure that, we, that was going to be used for Black Friday. And it's actually a very difficult problem to solve. Load testing is actually kind of tough because the amount of infrastructure you need just to load test is often about as high as you need just to run your, your infrastructure itself. And that's what, did, what that's we did as a team. We tried to use EC2 as a way to, we were trying to spin up EC2 instances to, as a way to uh, execute simulated users. So let me backtrack just a little bit. The idea here was that uh, as a team, there was a, we already had some sort of end-to-end -end testing tools, uh, Codeception in PHP. Uh, so the platform was built on, on, on PHP. And the, the, the tester in the team had built this really great suite of end-to-end -end tests using Codeception which is essentially a tool that lets you walk through your site by clicking links and filling in forms and selecting products in your catalog and adding them to your checkout and then going to a simulated checkout process on staging because you can't actually buy stuff on a credit card uh, and so on. But this meant that we could do end-to-end -end testing, but it also meant that we had a way to simulate the activity of a user, which was pretty handy. So what we needed to do was find a way to execute Codeception uh, on, on a sort of staging environment with a copy of the infrastructure that was planned for Black Friday, but with enough of these simulated users to simulate a lot of users hitting things all at once. And as you can see on the screen, we tried this with the EC2. We took some really beefy, massive EC2 instances at the time, and we could get about a thousand simultaneous users before the number of EC2 instances we need was just getting ridiculous, and it was getting way too expensive to manage this. It was very difficult to coordinate these simultaneous users across these EC2 instances. 
Uh, so it was actually a very difficult thing to do properly. Uh, we needed, we were trying to loop through things and it, it became a bit of a nightmare to manage. So we took a step back and we're like, okay, surely other people have had this problem. There must be people out there that have solved this. Maybe there's just a vendor we can use. Let's go take a look at these existing vendors. There must be somebody. To our surprise, on researching any any of these vendors, we found some some people that do this, um, but at best we could find people that were doing about 500 simulated users, which is okay, but we were hoping to hit something about 10 to 15,000 simultaneous users to really test this infrastructure that, that we needed. So 500 simulated users, plus it was super expensive. They were, they were looking to charge us thousands of dollars for 500 simul simulated users. Eh, this was kind of a no-go. Um, this was a real problem at the time. So we took another look at this, and, and this is when we realized that Lambda was probably the way to go, because with Lambda, we could use the existing integration testing framework using a PHP binary, and I talked about the whole binary situation, which is where that came up. This integration testing tool used uh, Chrome Headless, so that's where we had these Chrome Headless issues that, that I talked about. We solved the Chrome Headless issues, we solved the PHP binary issues, this was before Lambda Lays was a thing. And now we have the ability to execute a codeception test using PHP in Chrome Headless on a Lambda function. That's fantastic. That's just one simulated user though. What if we were able to find a way using Node to run this codeception test in, uh, in parallel, multiple, you know, using, uh, using the sort of the, the callback and, and asynchronous nature that you can call things inside a Node script? Great, now we have a single Lambda function that can run five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 simulated users. Now, how do we architect this uh, to be across as many Lambda functions as we can, we can handle? This is where serverless as a whole comes in because now we have the ability to do things like uh, add uh, 3,000 messages into an SNS topic and each SNS topic invokes a single Lambda function. So now we have 3,000 Lambda functions executing in parallel and each of those is gonna run five to 10 users in parallel. And this ended up giving us some really great results. Uh, the Lambda supercomputer was an absolute monster. We were, like I said, we were able to execute 3,000 Lambda functions in parallel, uh, or as close as possible, because we just needed as close to uh, 10 to 15,000 users as possible. We chose the maximum CPU setting for all of these Lambda functions, so I think it was over three gigs of memory, which means a really beefy CPU was allocated as well. And we could stably get about five simulated users per Lambda function. We, we were able to push this up to about 10, but then you'd have having issues. Some of those users were, were erroring out, and there was a couple of issues that cropped up. So we dropped it down to five just to be stable so we could replicate this really quickly and easily. And that meant that we got about 15,000 simultaneous users on our staging infrastructure to test whether this environment uh, could handle uh, that number of users. We could have pushed this higher. We could have asked for an increase in our Lambda, uh, inv uh, concurrent Lambda invocations, and that would have mean we could have gone up to about 4,000 simultaneous uh, Lambda functions as well. But 15,000 was, we were happy with that. That's kind of traffic that we hope to reach on a Black Friday, on a really good Black Friday anyway, at the time. And the end result of this is that we now had an API gateway endpoint that we could send a payload to, to, to pass the parameters, which we call a Lambda function, that would then uh, spin up, uh, send, uh, replicate that sort of payload of information into, uh, into a SNS topic. Uh, 3,000 times. That SNS topic would now call our, would basically uh, re, uh, uh, result in 3,000 Lambda functions all executing simultaneously at a web. We could do this any time. We could just spin up, uh, by hitting that API get to endpoint, we could spin up 15,000 uh, test users against whatever URL we wanted to. Technically, we could have DOSed people, but uh, we, 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 thankfully we weren't doing that. This was purely for our own load testing application. And again, as you can see, it's, it cost us about $60 to run that every single time. Whereas vendors were, were asking thousands of dollars for 500 simulated users, we were able to do 15,000 simultaneous users for about $60 a run. And we probably could have tweaked that, we probably could have reduced it a bit, but we were happy with that. $60, we only need to do a test three or four times. You do a test once, something falls over, you reconfigure, you run the test again, something else falls over, and so on until everything runs perfectly fine, and now you can stop testing because you've reached an end result. So this was, this was really awesome. This was a great test to do and resulted in just blowing away my expectations on what you can do with Lambda. Unfortunately, this huge amount of parallel, parallelization that you get from Lambda has a downside because if you're not careful, you can completely overwhelm the, uh, any downstream systems you may have. And I briefly touched on this with the RDS connections issue uh, uh, earlier. 
but the Lambda Stampede can be very real. And this is something that I've experienced again, uh, not related to RDS. Once we got past those problems, we, we kind of resolved those. But take me back to Expat Explore, where we had mid-year sale time. This was the big crunch time for the company. We have this massive once a year sale where the company announces the new tours for the new year with reduced prices, massive deal. Thousands of people are gonna be clamoring onto, this, onto the site to try and buy those seats as fast as they can before they sell out. Really, really big deal. So. Before this came, we decided, okay, we, we like serverless. Serverless is fantastic. It fell over last time when we didn't have serverless. We're re-architecting now. Let's re rebuild this booking process that always falls over with serverless. Let's, let's build this in the, in the technology we know is, is good that can help solve this problem for us. And it, it was absolutely fantastic. For the first time in a very long time, the company did not have its own internal platform falling over from the load. Serverless was a champ and handled this like a dream. The Lambda functions were executing, API Gator was going great, RDS had been maxed out, so we weren't worried about connections there. Everything was looking smashing. Except for the problem that our downstream provider that handled the booking engine, that handled more of the booking process for us, they weren't so happy with us. Um, we had over a thousand requests in less than 10 seconds uh, because Lambda just did what Lambda does. It just spun up uh, parallel executions, just kept sending that traffic downstream to the provider and they fell over uh, due to the volume of traffic. They'd never seen this volume of traffic from anybody before. They weren't ready for it. Their systems kind of fell over. They ended up throttling uh, our uh, account. So this caused us a lot of problems, uh, a lot of fighting uh, issues, uh, a lot of uh, accusations and, and so on. But Ultimately, this was a problem that we now realized we had to solve. We couldn't have this happen again for the next mid-year cell, uh, the next year. So we had some work to do. <clears throat> but at least we had proofed out serverless. We knew serverless was where we wanted to be. We just needed to manage the sort of downstream effect a lot better. So how do you do that? How do you manage Lambda killing things downstream from you? So there's a bunch of ways to manage this. And we found a few that we used uh, to, to manage all that sort of downstream stuff. The first one is find ways uh, some artificial ways to sort of debounce that incoming traffic a bit. And what we, what we ended up doing in the following year, um, the downstream provider hadn't upgraded the systems, and we warned them that we were doing the sale again, and they warned us not to do to them uh, that year that we did the previous year. So we had to find a, way, a better way to manage that. So one of the, one of the things we used was uh, what we call debouncing incoming traffic. And really what this means is that we had a sort of registration wall in front of the booking button. In the previous years, folks would come along and they'd look at the product screen and they'd see that, that product that they want to go buy right there with a countdown timer. So every time, when, as soon as the countdown timer hits zero, those few thousand people will click it at the same time, book at the same time, that traffic goes instantly to the downstream provider and they get overwhelmed. So in this case, we turned on a registration button, which means that somebody has to go click register, they have to go type in their email address, tick, 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 they have to go type in a password, tick, 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 tick. while they're doing this, five other people have already done it. When they click it, there's only three other people that have done it with them, there's another five people, and so on. So you're just kind of slowing down this progression. Uh, so you just manage, yeah, thundering herd problem. Thanks, Roger. We're managing the thundering herd there. We're kind of slowing things down. People really want to buy what we have to offer, but let's just filter them through a bit more slowly. Let's make them go through a couple of extra steps. I think we had another page where they then had to select the actual tour that they want. So now you've got people going, um, um, scrolling up and down, slowing people down. It's a great way to manage that. There are other ways to manage this. So uh, you can, there are existing services inside AWS that lets you help, and that helps you to sort of manage this kind of thundering herd problem. And a few of those are SQS and Kinesis. And these have been great for me in the, since then just to help find a way to build up the, the, the processing you need to do and stuff that can be delayed by a few seconds. Um, and in the situation, we have this massive sale and people are sitting there and they might have to wait a few seconds for their, their job to be done. They'll be okay with it because they really want that really low price. Generally, this, this works out fine. As long as people are not gonna lose their, lose their spot, We've used tools like SQS and Kinesis and WebSockets, for example, to help us find ways to sort of manage that problem and, and, and managing the thundering herd, as it were. The other really obvious one, and this is really critical, so if you have an absolute downstream limitation, like an RDS database with only 60 connections, look at reserve concurrency. It's a really nice feature in AWS for Lambda. You can basically say to Lambda, I do not ever want more than 60 Lambda functions running in parallel uh, uh, ever. And you just set that number and it'll never happen. But you then need to have the ability to manage the errors that are going to come from AWS when you try to spin up that 61st uh, parallel invocation. 
So it's a great way to sort of hard stop that, uh, the ability to drown out those downstream uh, sources, because if you have no control over them, you don't want to bring them down because you can't bring them back up again. So you may need to have that hard limit, but you can build in managing those errors. So you get some nice clean errors, you can just handle that pretty nicely. So there are ways to manage this, but it's something to be aware of. You're going you're gonna to kill things downstream if you're not careful. And that's really it for me. Um, I hope that didn't end too abruptly. We went from getting started to the thundering herd and, and, and everything in between. Uh, there's some details for me, so feel free to uh, send me messages on Twitter, like I said before. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. And if you prefer email, then feel free to hit me up at gareth at serverless.com. I love talking about serverless, and I might bend your ear too far, so tell me to stop if you, if you really want to. Uh, but, yeah, if there's any questions, I believe we are going to switch to a uh, answer question session now. Yes, thank you, Gareth. That was very insightful. Um, it's the first time that I've. Oh, I'm still muted. Huh? Am I? No, I'm not. It's the first time that I've ever heard of the um, Lambda supercomputer. <laughs> That's quite interesting. Um, I see we have a f we have a few questions. The first one was from Eugene. Um, he he was asking about New Relic. Did you? Did you run it with the Lambda function for these stats for X-Ray? So I'm guessing he's asking, how did you get the stats? Mm. So the new relic uh, exposure that I've got is mostly on the sort of APM side, on EC2 instances running the regular old PHP applications. Um, and new relic excels at that. Um, they've got some really good stuff involved in that. Um, the the downside, well, things have changed with New Relic. They've recently bought out a, uh, a monitoring provider that focuses exclusively on serverless. Uh, so there is that. Um, but they're trying to move into the serverless realm, the last I heard, and they're, they're increasing their, their product offering. Um, I have not, uh, I, I did try to use New Relic in the past for monitoring Lambda functions, but there were some issues there. They, they not, their, their setup is based on server instances. Even their billing model is purely based on server instances, so it's not quite... Uh, where it was at the time that we needed it. Um, and right now, though, if you if you do need some kind of monitoring platform for your serverless applications, the serverless framework has one. We have a platform. If you go to uh, serverless.com, you'll see a link there. You go to dash, dashboard.serverless.com. You can sign up there. And it integrates pretty seamlessly with your existing serverless framework services. So our focus on this, platform, on this product is to integrate very nicely with the framework itself. Because we built the framework, we know how it works. We can build in monitoring really nicely for you. Uh, but New Relic, the last I checked, and I, you know, I'm going to admit I, I'm not up to date with the current state of New Relic. So feel free to go check them out if you want to see what they're like. The last I checked, though, they 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 focus on serverless wasn't as extensive, so it was a bit tricky to use New Relic. Um, I can also speak from this. Um, so the AWS CloudWatch, they also have this metric called concurrent invocations, which you can use to kind of monitor your cold starts. There's also a few tricks um, that you can do by using your um, like that space above your handler, where you can kind of cache um, just a variable there that says this function has been spun up, and you can also calculate the amount of cold starts like that. I think um, he, I think that Eugene asked a question round about there in your slide. Eugene, um, did the oh, in cold function. So. So quickly as well, the, the serverless framework, the, the platform I'm talking about also includes the ability to uh, check out cold starts. And that graphic I showed you on the screen where we were discussing cold starts, uh, we're showing the count of cold starts in that case. So yeah, I mean, there's, there are tools out there that can give you that information. Okay, and then I see that Roger was asking um, what was the reason for running Headless Chrome with Lambda, but I think you mentioned that you were running into end test, right? Yeah, uh, Headless Chrome is really useful, especially if you look at things like, um, oh, what's that tool called, Cypress? So Cypress can use uh, Headless Chrome, I believe. I haven't used Cypress myself, but again, it's an end-to-end -end testing tool that does a really great job. So yeah, it gets very, it becomes very, and we actually, funny enough, we see a lot of people really wanting to use Headless Chrome instead of Lambda all the time. It happens all the time. <laughs> um, then Wayne was asking, what's your, um, what's your opinion of the AWS CDK? Uh, so CDK is a great improvement on some of the stuff that's uh, natively built in with AWS. Um, 
AWS has, well, CloudFormation, uh, oh, okay, you backtrack even a bit more. CloudFormation is a great uh, DevOps tool, um, but not so great for developers. So AWS's uh, solution to that was to build SAM uh, on top of CloudFormation, essentially, to try and give a better sort of dev experience. And it has improved things to some degree. I might be biased because, you know, I, I am from serverless, and that's what I've used since 2016. I feel like the serverless framework is the best way to deploy serverless applications in the cloud. Um, but CDK is, is a really good improvement, and there are a lot of tools that build on top of CDK and make use of that. Um, one of the downsides, unfortunately, of CDK is that I've found that they are changing the API quite a bit, so there's some inconsistency there when it comes to that. But, yeah, CDK is, is, is still a pretty good tool. Yes, I I actually love this CDK. Um, like just this, like just this morning, I was um, passing variables all between stacks and things because I'm not quite um, like I don't quite like the nested stacks just because you can't see change, you can't you can't see your change sets um, that cloud formation generates for you. So. When you deploy those, it's almost like a like I just hold your thumbs that nothing in production will fall over. I don't know if if your um, clients also experience that, Gareth, because I know you said that you kind of like the the nested stack approach. Um, so to be to clarify, uh, I'm not the biggest fan of the nested stack approach personally. I think it's a great stopgap if you're hitting this cloud formation limit. So if you hit that limit and you need to deploy. You have to get this stuff out. Right now, you, you, can't, you can't spend time redeveloping stuff. Use the nested stack. It solves the problem for now. Deploy, get your stuff out there. Now, when you've got the time, sit back and rework things so that you can step away from that, that, the, 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 the limit issue. And just to, just to uh, uh, go on a bit more about that, the reason why I suggest that is that the nested stack plugs, plugin can solve the problem for now, but it can add additional problems later. There are other limits that you can end up reaching. Recently, I've, I've seen somebody reach an IAM policy size limit of 1024 Same. megs or something like that. So because they continue to add more and more stuff on with the nested stack plugin, they're hitting these other limits that end up causing problems. And just the way that those, those plugins rewire some of the stuff that your serverless, the serverless framework does, for example, it can then conflict with even other plugins. So it, it can get a bit messy. Uh, but again, it's a great stopgap. Roger, um, do you maybe want to unmute your mic and just ask your firecracker question? You can also share your video. You're more than welcome. Um. Roger, are you there? Uh, well, I can, I, I, can, I can talk about it. Um, so I, AWS is using Firecracker for running Lambda functions. That is, the funny thing is Firecracker was created by AWS to, to run Lambda functions. That's its sole purpose. And they then decided after they had Lambda functions running with Firecracker to make it uh, open source. So it wasn't as if Firecracker was an open source product that they decided, oh, that sounds like a great thing for Lambda. It was more a case of this is running Lambda, let's make it open source. Uh, so that's that's pretty much where Firecracker has come from. Last I last I recall from the talks that I've heard. No, um, yes, that's about it. Sorry. You can speak, Roger. I. Uh, yeah, Rian, um, I, I think uh, it's more that Firecrack uh, addressed the problem that AWS had with its services. I think um, for a specific account, you can only run Lambda functions. Um, it it uh, Lambda functions uh, are run in a in a in a virtual machine uh, for mm -hmm. a specific account, and I think. Um, with Firecracker, they uh, and that that seemed to cost AWS a lot of money because uh, they had these warm sandboxes, I think. Uh, and um, if if a person, for example, just ran a couple of functions, then uh, they had for that specific account, they were still um, using that virtual machine um, to run these um, um, these uh, instances of uh, Lambda functions. I think uh, that's where the Firecracker uh, provided a higher consolidation ratio um, for these machines. And I think that was why they, they decided. I think going forward, I think they will be using Firecracker for most of their applications. The, the interesting thing is, uh, sharing to, uh, sharing, we, I mean, being a serverless, luckily we have some have some contacts. We, we chat to folks at AWS quite often. Um, 
And the interesting thing is Firecracker has been used at uh, AWS for Lambda for a, quite a long time now, uh, even before it came out as an open source product. Um, and, and just the basic architecture of, of how they, if I remember correctly, how it was described to me is that when you, the reason why you have a 3,000 concurrency limit with Lambda is that that infrastructure is up and running. They, there is an e, basically an EC2 instance or multiple running on your account in the background that you're not paying for, essentially, that has the capacity to spin up this, these concurrent Lambda functions for you. And uh, Firecracker is what creates the micro VMs that your Lambda function executes in. So essentially, you have a micro VM within an EC2 VM that runs on the bare metal, ultimately. Um, and, and, and Firecracker, and the reason they do this is that EC2 encapsulates you within your account. Uh, so that protects you within that account scenario so that your uh, micro VMs aren't interacting even uh, vaguely with anybody else's micro VMs in that environment. So that, 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 that's a security layer that, that protects you from that. Um, this was actually being tested quite extensively by other folks where yeah. they tried to call into other Lambda functions and just couldn't. There's a barrier, there's a virtual machine barrier there uh, provided by EC2. Uh, uh, and that's ultimately, yeah? I think uh, they call them to prevent side channel attacks, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's what or the purpose of that, um, the micro VMs. So really, the micro VMs are designed to be as small and minute as possible. Uh, that's why you end up having the binary issue that I mentioned before, because most of the libraries you normally associate with a Linux OS is just not there. Um, they, they, they remove them to make the ability to spin up these micro VMs really quickly. Uh, you know, they, they try to enhance that. Um, so th that's where Firecracker was essentially born from, was a way to very quickly spin up these tiny little instances that don't need to do as much as a full-blown uh, virtual machine, which takes a lot longer. Uh, and then ultimately what happened was they built this technology. They realized that this is a great thing to potentially open source and get some developer cred. Great on them because that means you can now take Firecracker and spin up your Lambda clone whenever, wherever you like uh, using this open source product. Um, but I think it was also a way for them to, sh to say to people, this is, Lambda is a technology you should be using. And if you want to vet the product, here is the code that we use to run your Lambda function. So you can see it's open source. You can go take a look at the code see what this looks like, make sure it's secure for your users, that you like what you see before you go use it in our environment, which is a clever idea because that's what open source gives a lot of organizations. They, people see that they're happy, they use Elasticsearch because they, if they really want to, they can go and inspect the, the open source code for that and, and so on. It's just, it's just good developer relations essentially.